Hey guys how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. Today we will see what if Naruto was born with hair as red as his mother's, if you enjoy then please like share and do comments. By the time Uzumaki Naruto had turned 5 years old, he had come to realize that a good majority of the people in his village hated him. It was not an immediate realization, as the haze of colors and sounds called infancy slowly but inevitably passed, he first came into the awareness of his individuality. Looking down at his stubby toes and observing how they wriggled at his every command, he saw that he was his own person. His body and mind belonged to him and only him, and as far as he could tell, every other person that he saw possessed this right. All of the people in his village were the same as him in this regard. However, he gradually began to see differences between these other people and himself. When Naruto first visited the village playground at the age of four, he saw many other children running around in the dust. Another young boy was chasing them making threatening sounds, and Naruto felt rather frightened, however, the other children were laughing as if they were having fun. When he asked another child what was going on, he looked at Naruto strangely and asked him if he'd never played tag before. When Naruto returned to his home that evening and asked his caretaker, a stern-faced woman with dark hair, about the game, she merely slammed a bowl of rice down on his table and told him to stay away from the other children. He didn't understand why the other children could play tag together and why he couldn't, but his caretaker's hand was even faster and sharper than her words, so he shut up and ate his dinner. But from then on, though he didn't approach the other children, Naruto did start going out more by himself. He was starting to get sick of the tattered book of folk tales that he had thumbed through since he was two, and felt that he was a bit too old for the cracked old wooden blocks he'd once fondly stacked for hours before. He was a whole five years old, after all. And besides, he quite enjoyed the feel of the sun and wind on his skin. The few times Naruto had been out in public before, he had usually been with his caretaker, who always insisted on him covering his head and lower face with a scarf. She'd told him it was so that he wouldn't pick up any diseases, but now that he was exploring the streets of his village, he was beginning to have second thoughts. Because wherever he went, inevitably, he was followed by an intense storm of heated whispering. He hadn't realized at first, even following the realization of his individuality, he'd never thought of himself as particularly unique. He'd read before in his book of folktales that no two snowflakes were alike, and as such, so were people. But in the winter, when snow covered the village, there were so many snowflakes that he couldn't possibly distinguish between them. This, he realized could be the same for himself, and for everyone else. And yet somehow, these people managed to point him out, a single snowflake in a flurry of snow. They pointed him out with barely disguised grimaces, they ushered their children away from him, admonishing them for walking too close to him, and chased him out of their stores. The first time this happened, Naruto wondered if they wanted to play tag with him and was about to open his mouth to ask. When they slammed the door in his face, sending dust flying in his face. Before he could get up, he heard a spitting sound, and he felt a warm sensation on his face. When he touched his face and looked at his hand, it was wet. He immediately returned to his home afterwards. Ignoring the dinner his caretaker had left out on the table, Naruto crawled into his bed with the lights off and the blinds to his window closed shut. He stared into the darkness for the rest of the day, trembling. All of the following days that he went outside ended quite similarly. As time went on, even the other children began to notice him, and unlike the adults, they went out of their way to taunt him. Naruto observed this all and every night, stared into the darkness. After the initial shock had worn off, he began to ponder his situation, trying to find an answer to the question of why he, as an individual, was targeted in such a manner. He wondered if it was because of his appearance, after all, when he ventured outside with his scarf on, nobody treated him like an aberration, or even worse, pretend he didn't exist. If they accidentally bumped into him they apologized, and if he bumped into someone, they pet his head when he apologized. Recently, some of the other children had started to call him, Tomato Head, because of the shock of red hair that framed his thin face, but he did not think that could be why he was singled out so much. He had examined his features quite closely at one point, his hair color was a bit unusual, but he had seen others with brightly colored hair in the playground quite a few times, and nobody ever glared at them or said unkind things to them. He had blue eyes, a quite ordinary trait, and though he was a bit small for his age, he was in no way deformed. He had counted carefully, 
He had one head, a face with all of its features, two arms, hands, and feet, and ten fingers and toes. Just like every other child, some of the adults sometimes were missing a finger or a limb. In fact, the only really unique thing about him was the pair of faint whisker-like birthmarks on his cheeks. Naruto had noticed that some of the village clans, like the Inazuka clan, had physical markers for their members. So sometimes, he liked to sit in front of a mirror and imagine what it'd be like to have other people who had bright red hair and whisker marks on their faces. And then inevitably, his thoughts would turn to his dead parents. He knew that he was an orphan, and that they had died on the same day he was born, his caretaker had told him that much. His situation was fairly common following the Third Shinobi World War and the attack of the Nine Tails. His apartment was not too far from the orphanage, which teemed with children. In fact, Naruto hadn't even realized that he didn't have parents until he saw for the first time an adult picking up one of the children at the playground. Looking into the darkness, his thoughts unimpeded by jeers and glares, Naruto eventually came to a conclusion. Having compared his behavior to that of other children, he knew that he himself could not be at fault for the behavior of the village people towards him. He never asked for anything that he didn't need, he ate, almost, all of his vegetables, and he always obeyed his caretaker. He briefly wondered whether he was just ugly, but upon hesitantly asking his caretaker, she'd snorted and told him to stop asking her stupid questions and to finish his soup. So Naruto finished his soup, and after tossing and turning in bed that night, decided he couldn't control whether he was ugly or not, and anyone who thought otherwise, well they were the stupid ones. Despite his brave thoughts however, Naruto didn't go out the following morning, and instead remained curled up in his bed. By the time he finally got up and pulled up the blinds, the afternoon sun was high in the sky. As the summer glow warmed his face, Naruto dully listened to the sounds of the village people passing by below, the chatter of their daily life resounding in his ears. Pick up some eggs from the market. Won't step a foot in the library, you know. He's gone for a week to wind country. Naruto's eyes flew open. Wind country? While he knew that he lived in Konoha, the hidden village of fire country, the thought that there were other countries had never occurred to him. Yet thinking about it now, it seemed such an obvious thing. He'd never left the village himself, but he'd seen the gates opening and closing many times, and seen the travelers and merchants streaming in and out. Though the small glimpses of the outside he'd managed to get through the gates showed only a forest, he realized now, those people must have been headed somewhere. It was then that a sudden terrible, amazing, alien thought came to him. Maybe, he could join them. It had never even been a possibility to Naruto before, but he felt himself quickly warming up to the idea. Since the people in his village didn't want him, yes, why not? Maybe he could just leave. A faint shadow of himself began to play before his eyes. He could imagine it. An older version of himself stepping with confidence through the gates and traveling through the forest. After a while, he'd find another village and be welcomed with open arms and to the sound of cheers and and, maybe he'd even find other people there with red hair and whiskers on their faces, and. With a loud resounding sound, Naruto slapped his hands on his face. Furiously, he shook his head. He was being stupid. He was an orphan. He didn't have any family members elsewhere. His caretaker had made that clear enough. And if he was this hated in his own village, when he'd done nothing, what were the chances of his being accepted anywhere else? Turning his back on the sun. Naruto let his face cool in the darkness. While it had sounded like a great idea, maybe leaving the village wasn't the answer. But if that wasn't, then what was? Was there anything else he could do? Sometimes, he wondered what it was like to walk outside in the sun without being jeered at. It would be nice, he thought, to not have to wear his scarf. And sometimes, when he saw the other children leaving the playground holding their parents' hands, something throbbed within his chest. The leaves of the trees in the hills had long since turned orange and red, before the answer came to Naruto from a rather unexpected source. On the morning of his sixth birthday, he woke up to find the room cold and with no breakfast on the table. His caretaker had always made him three meals a day, washed the dishes after him, done his laundry, and cleaned his small apartment once a week. She'd never had a kind word for him, in fact, she'd rarely spoke to him at all, but she'd never made him starve before. Blearily staring at the empty table as he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, Naruto didn't notice the masked individual that suddenly appeared on the open window sill. Before he could do much else, the man had forcefully picked him up and jumped out the window. At first, 
Thinking that someone had finally decided to attack him in his home, he struggled in the strange man's grip, clawing at the man's chest. But he then realized that the man was wearing a porcelain animal mask and metal chest armor, and relaxed. As much as he was hated by the rest of the village, it was common knowledge that the strange animal mask men worked for the Hokage. Sure enough, he was dumped unceremoniously into the Hokage's office. Naruto didn't remember ever having been in here before, but he could read the characters, Hokage, on the desk in the middle, which his top was overflowing with stacks of paper and scrolls. The Hokage himself stood before him. His aged countenance and wizened form almost belied the strong, unwavering eyes that observed him from below the white hat. Naruto quivered and began to look away, but unlike the villagers, the Hokage's gaze held no animosity or hatred. So he met the elder ninja's dark eyes with his own, and for a moment, he thought he might have seen a flicker of emotion within them. But then it was gone, and he turned away. Naruto learned several things that day. Though he'd never really thought about it before, he now learned that the Hokage had been his benefactor paying for his caretaker, and that now that he was six, she would no longer be coming by. He would receive a monthly stipend from the Hokage, but he would have to prepare his own meals and clean up after himself. And finally, he learned that he was to attend the academy, starting immediately. Running as fast as his legs could carry him back to his apartment, Naruto was so excited that for once, he didn't even notice the glaring that followed him. After all, the academy was the holy grail for the children at the playground. Having a sibling in it gave you automatic bragging rights, and if you were going to be joining it yourself, uncontested rights to the best swing, bar nothing. For the first time in his life, he felt a rising airy sensation in his chest that he didn't know the word for. However, that evening, Naruto watched the sun set from his window, and with the growing darkness, he began to feel a niggling sense of doubt. He'd never been allowed to join or be a part of anything before. Would attending the academy really change anything for him? He'd always admired the ninja. Their mystique and power made them just like the heroes of his childhood folk tales. But could he become like one of them? And if he did, would people stop hating him? Or was he doomed to be hated for the rest of his life? His fingers, rested on the window sill, clenched into his palms, leaving behind red marks. No, Naruto decided, none of that mattered. He would just become a ninja that they couldn't ignore or despise. He would become so great, his red hair or his whisker marks wouldn't matter. Whether they thought he was ugly or stupid, none of that would matter. He would become the most revered and respected ninja of Konoha. He would become Hokage. Even if he couldn't own their bodies or their minds, he vowed, he would own their hearts. The next morning found Naruto scanning his own appearance before the mirror. If he was going to become Hokage, he knew he should at least have the ability to make a good first impression on his teacher and his classmates. Thankfully, his caretaker had at least done the laundry before she left. Now, he was wearing his best, or rather, least threadbare, clothes. His hair on the other hand, was a completely different story. It was a spiky red mane that hung down to his neck. Rolling a lock of the bright hair between his fingers, Naruto wondered if he should trim it. He glanced out his window, and let go of the lock. He could see the Hokage monument from his apartment, and if the busts were accurate, the second, third, and fourth had all had rather crazy spiky hair. Clearly, their hair hadn't impeded their rise to the top, and he figured that his wouldn't either. In fact, he thought in a passing way, the fourth's hair even rather resembled his own. Nevertheless, he dug out a brush that hadn't seen the light of day since it had been bought, and dutifully tugged it through his hair. Finally, with one last check in the mirror, smoothening out a non-existent crease in his shirt, he left his apartment and headed to the academy. Before he entered the building, Naruto paused and looked up at the circular sign that proudly hung in the niche above the doors. The character for, Shinobi, was emblazoned on it in bold ink, and he knew enough to know that it was made up by the separate characters of, Blade, and, Heart. Together, it meant, Endure. It seemed appropriate considering the goal that he had in mind. Tracing the character with a finger on his palm, he took a deep breath and stepped through the doors. The classroom was large with a high ceiling, and filled with rows of desks, stacked in an increasing, rising order like a staircase. When Naruto walked in, following his new instructor, a man with an old scar across his face who had introduced himself as Amino Aruka, a palpable ripple of surprise swept through the room. The noise level in the class sharply dropped, as dozens of pairs of eyes turned to observe him. 
Naruto didn't meet any of their narrowed gazes, but stood awkwardly in front of the blackboard. Offhandedly, he realized that he recognized one of the faces that stared back at him. It belonged to the girl with the large forehead who he'd noticed getting picked on a few times in the playground. This is Uzumaki Naruto, Uruka introduced in a ringing voice. At the sound of his name, some of the children began to whisper amongst themselves. He's six years old, and he'll be joining our class from today onwards, so make him feel welcome. I hope we can be friends, said Naruto, forcing the tips of his lips up into a smile. He'd never had much of a reason to make one before, but he had observed from afar how smiles could lower people's guards. He thought he heard some snickers and maybe even a muttered, tomato head, but for the most part, the children only stared back at him sullenly. Considering his introduction largely a success, Naruto found an empty seat next to another boy with a dark countenance, who idly rested his head on his hand. It turned out that the class had been going over how to read and write several basic characters that he already knew, so for the first hour, Naruto had the unhindered liberty of observing his new instructor. Uruka had seemed courteous enough when he first introduced himself outside of the classroom, but he wondered what the Chunin truly thought of him. Uruka certainly seemed jumpy about him. In the last ten minutes alone, his eyes had flickered four times over to where Naruto was sitting, and he had stumbled over his words each time. Judging by the sheen of his face, the man was sweating slightly as well, and Naruto had learned from first-hand experience that, if it wasn't from the heat, it indicated they were nervous. From his brief personal interaction with the instructor, Naruto could already tell that Aruka was usually a proficient teacher. Discreetly looking around, every time Aruka fumbled over a sentence, he saw looks of puzzlement reflected on the faces of his classmates, confirming the fact. He returned his gaze to the chunin just as the man in question looked up at Naruto, and their eyes met for a split second. Aruka gave no visible signs of reacting, and looked away almost immediately, mistakenly writing a different character on the blackboard as he did so. But Naruto already knew, though it was just the smallest glimmer, he had seen that same, strange look of fear and revulsion that everyone else in the village had whenever they saw him. His spirits beginning to sink, he wondered whether he would be kicked out of the academy after all. After the lesson on reading and writing, the class moved on to chakra, and suddenly, Naruto found himself out of his depth. Apparently, there was something called a chakra point, and a person had 361 of them. There was also something called hand seals, and the 12 basic ones were named after the horoscope animals. But not knowing what chakra itself actually was, Naruto could barely follow the discussion, let alone participate. From the sounds of it, it sounded like magic, but he'd always thought magic was mere fantasy. So what else could it be? An hour of torture later, the class was over, and the students were given a short lunch break. As most of the other children filed out of the room, Naruto dawdled at his desk before approaching the instructor, who was flipping through a sheaf of papers on a clipboard. Uruka sensei Naruto began in a low voice, looking down at the ground. Most adults didn't like it when he looked at them directly. Yes, Naruto? He heard the rustle of paper above him. Uruka's tone was casual, but Naruto thought he could detect a note of tension. Could you tell me what chakra is? When the man didn't answer right away, Naruto looked up and hurriedly added, the discussion was very interesting, and I wanted to join in, but, I'm still not sure what it is, and where it comes from. To his relief, Naruto observed some of the tension leave the instructor's face, though he still looked perplexed. Well Naruto, chakra is a form of energy that all living things have. The energy is a mold of physical and spiritual, and goes around your body in a network. We ninjas can use this chakra to perform techniques. Uruka paused, before adding, do you know what a technique is? Naruto shook his head no. A technique is a skill made possibly by chakra, with effects like walking on water, exhaling fire, and creating illusions. There are all kinds of techniques, such as ninjutsu, genjutsu, taijutsu, and even the most basic one requires you to mold your chakra. Usually, techniques require a certain sequence of hand seals. To demonstrate, he put his two hands together and quickly made some signs. There was a burst of smoke, and suddenly, someone who looked exactly like Naruto was standing in front of him. Letting out a small exclamation of amazement, he stepped back. There was another burst of smoke, and Aruka was standing before him again. That was the transformation technique. 
It's one of the most basic ninjutsu techniques, and we'll be learning it when your class is a bit more advanced. Eagerly, Naruto put his hands together and mimicked the man's hand signs. To his disappointment, nothing happened. Just doing the motions won't be enough, I'm afraid, said Uruka with a smile. Naruto's eyes widened at the sight, and the smile slid off of the man's face like sap. He coughed. Well, off you go now. Naruto left with his heart pounding. He couldn't remember anyone having ever smiled at him before. And unlike the smile he himself had given the class, this hadn't been an offering of goodwill. It had been the genuine article. Feeling like a large burden had been removed from his shoulders, Naruto began to wander the village, looking for a place to eat that wouldn't chase him out. So long as he didn't get on Aruka's bad side, maybe he would be able to learn everything he wanted about being a ninja. And then, he would be that much closer to becoming the Hokage. As Naruto passed by a small restaurant, a ninja with a face mask stepped out from under its flap. As the flap dropped down, the most hauntingly delicious aroma he had ever smelled came wafting out, freezing him in place. There was a big paper lantern hanging outside, it said, Ramen Ichiraku, in bold red characters. As though entranced, before he knew it, he had lifted the flap and stepped in. Several of the villagers were already there, eating, and at his entry they looked up at him. Reacting on instinct, Naruto tensed, waiting for them to glare at him, but instead, their faces grew pale. Rising to their feet with a clatter, they all left in a hurry, leaving behind an array of empty stools. Well, that was a new reaction. Even he'd never cleared a restaurant out like that before. Feeling a chill run down his back, Naruto turned to the counter to find himself face to face with a stern-faced man in an apron. He waited for him to respond angrily, but instead, the man grunted, what'll you have? Taken aback, Naruto's eyes flickered over to the menu and he stammered out the first item he saw, miso ramen. Less than 10 minutes later, the most majestic bowl of noodles he had ever seen in his life was placed in front of him. Slowly, he raised his chopsticks to his mouth, and as warmth spread through his body, his chopsticks picked up in pace, and soon he was inhaling the rest of the bowl. It was not to last, however. Hearing the stools beside him clattering once more, he looked up, and almost choked on a noodle. They were a rowdy group of children he recognized from his class at the academy. Hunching over his bowl, he tried to shrink in on himself. But without his scarf, there was nothing to hide his hair. Well, what do you know? Hey look everyone, it's Tomato Head, said one of the boys, jumping up from his seat. His friends joined him, and they rapidly spread out around Naruto to surround him. He said stiffly, my name is Naruto. What was that Tomato Head? The boy said in a loud voice, cupping his ear as if he hadn't been able to hear him. When Naruto didn't respond, he dropped his hand and glanced over at his sniggering friends. Nogi here says she heard you asking Ruka sensei about what chakra is. Yay, sensei couldn't believe it. Chortled a pudgy girl. He told us after you left that you didn't know nothing and that, she sniffed, we should help you out. Ah, does little baby need his diapers changed? The boy crowed. He leaned over and swiped Naruto's bowl. Does tomato head want his mommy? Oh wait. He laughed and lifted the bowl to his lips. You don't have one. Blinking, Naruto watched the bully slurp up the remainder of his ramen. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw that the owner of the restaurant was preoccupied with another customer. It's not nice to make fun of people about their parents, he finally said in a mild tone that belied the increasingly hot fire that burned in his belly. What would you know about being nice? It's not like you ever had parents to teach you, scoffed a girl. My parents told me to stay away from you, cause you're bad, added the boy with relish. I'm not bad, gasped Naruto before he could stop himself. You're too, no I'm not, are too, I'm not, are too, damn tomato head, no one wants you here. The boy lifted his hand up with the bowl still in hand. Not comprehending, Naruto watched dumbly as the bowl flew through the air and hit him on the chest with a crash, spilling cold liquid all over his best clothes. Hey, the owner had finally noticed what was going on, but at the sound of his voice, the children all scrambled out, the restaurant's flaps swinging emptily in their wake. Naruto stood frozen for a second, watching with wide eyes the oily liquid drip from the ends of his hair. There was a big black splotch now on his favorite orange shirt that he knew would never come out. Regaining control of his body, he slowly bent over to pick up the bowl, which had thankfully not cracked. 
Placing it back on the counter, he hesitantly peeked up. The owner stared down at him with a twisted look he didn't understand, and flinching, he apologized, before lowering his head back down again. Putting some coins down on the counter, he left. Not daring to lift his head back up, he raced back to his home. Though no voices called out to him, the whole, long way back, he thought he could feel glares burning into his back. Once he was home, Naruto robotically began to pull out some of his more worn spare clothes from the closet. All he could think about was how he had to quickly change and return to the academy before the lunch break was over, or else he would get in trouble on his first day. If he was to become a great Hokage, he couldn't get kicked out. It was only when he was zipping down his ruined hoodie that he noticed that his fingers were trembling. And then, as he wondered why they were doing that, he also realized that he had lost all strength in his legs. Letting out a small, oh, he fell down on his knees in the dark room. Automatically hunching over on his hands, Naruto felt something warm and wet streak down the sides of his face and land with a plop on the floor. In a detached sort of way, he realized with surprise that he was crying. He had observed before, from afar people crying for a variety of reasons. Sometimes, people, mostly children, cried when they weren't getting their way. Once, he'd seen a girl about his age burst into tears when her mother refused to buy her a stick of candy, and observed how the mother had given in. When he experimentally asked his caretaker to buy him a stick of candy, she'd wordlessly stared at him coldly, as though looking at a particularly disgusting insect on the backside of her sandal. He'd never asked her for anything again after that. Most of the time however, people cried because they were in pain or because they were sad. When a child fell over in the playground and began to cry, their mother or father would frantically look up at the sound of their voice, and run over. When they saw that the child had only scraped a knee, they would laugh in relief and place a band-aid over their injury. Then the child would feel magically better and go back to playing with their friends. As he wondered which emotion he was feeling, Naruto began to feel even more strange. There was a hazy sensation creeping up his body and taking over. And then suddenly, against his will, he collapsed down completely with his face pressed against the ground. Someone was making a terrible moaning sound, and for several seconds, he listened in alarm as he looked for its source, before realizing that it was coming from himself. A mixture of snot and tears was streaming down his face, and he began to worry about how he couldn't go back to the academy with a splotchy face when suddenly, he realized that he didn't care. He wasn't sure what this heaviness in his chest was, but he didn't want to feel it anymore. And if crying would help him lessen it, he would do it. After all, no one was there to hear him. If he wanted to become a strong ninja, he knew he could never let anyone else see him crying, because the heroes in his book had never cried. But right now, he was alone in this cold, dark room. Just this once, he thought, eyes squeezed shut and tears dripping from his nose. A cold and detached part of Naruto thought that he should be pleased to have this privacy. But at the same time, he had never felt so alone before. He felt like he was the only person in the world. And the winner is, Sasuke. As the watching students cheered, Naruto, lying flat on his back, looked up at the sky. It was a nice day, he thought, with only a few clouds in the sky. After a few seconds passed, dredging up the last of his willpower, he clambered up to his feet, ignoring how sore his body felt. Brushing the dirt off of his pants, he walked to the edge of the wooden platform and leapt heavily down. The next bout will be between, Sakura and Ino. He heard Aruka call out, and two squabbling girls jumped up to the platform. Nice one, Naruto, a boy called out. Without responding, Naruto passed him by, but not before he heard the boy add, you lasted almost 10 seconds up there. The children standing near them laughed, and feeling the tips of his ears beginning to burn, Naruto abruptly picked up pace and ran back inside the academy building. His footsteps pounded loudly through the hallway, and even though he knew he should be practicing how to run without making a sound, he couldn't bring himself to care. The door to his classroom opened with a clatter, and straining on his tiptoes, he grabbed his bag from his cubby near the end. Naruto knew it was wrong to leave when academy wasn't even over, but the only thing they were doing for the rest of the day was the one-on-one -on -one taijutsu fights. No one would notice him gone, except maybe Nogi and her friends, anyways. Just as he neared the open doors to the front exit, Naruto heard the sound of adult conversation, and skidded to a halt. His heart pounding in his ears, he looked right and left, looking for a place to hide. 
As the sound grew closer and closer, he chose the first thing he'd noticed, dashing into the niche between the door and the wall. The students coming along? They're very promising. We're conducting this year's first Taijutsu tournament today, and they're all performing excellently. Naruto's eyes widened as he recognized Aruka's voice. Hadn't he just been back at the arena? What was he doing here now? Had he noticed Naruto was gone? Unable to put aside his rising curiosity, he put an eye to the crack of the door, and then seeing the person beside Aruka, he felt his heart skip a beat. The Hokage was standing right in front of the very door he was now quivering behind. Ah, Fugaku's younger son is in your class, no? Quite precocious, isn't he? Actually, while I'd hate to see him go, I think that if he continues to perform as well as he is doing now, transferring him to a more advanced class wouldn't be out of the question. They are brothers after all, the Hokage chuckled. There was a short pause, as the Hokage seemed to be surveying the academy building. For a horrifying instant, Naruto thought that the elderly ninja's gaze had paused on the sliver of his face, and had to fight the urge to run. But then he turned away, and Naruto felt some of the feeling begin to return to his face. They resumed talking, but began to move away in the direction of where the other children were, and after a short while, Naruto finally came out from his hiding spot. His head turning back and forth rapidly to survey the empty lot, Naruto ran as fast as he could, only coming to a stop when he reached the cover of a patch of trees. Panting, he rested for a few minutes against the trunk of a cherry blossom tree. Two weeks had passed since he joined the academy, and Naruto had quickly learned that it wasn't just basic ninja knowledge that he was behind in. Many of the other students were from clans or had ninja relatives, and they had been training since well before joining the academy. It was all Naruto could do to keep up with the daily physical exercise, and he was completely out of his depth when it came to actual taijutsu. While the other children were flipping through the air and flowing from one stance to the next, Naruto was still struggling to follow along without landing flat on his back. He desperately needed more instruction, but Uruka only had so much time to spend on him before he had to move on to the other children. Uruka had told Naruto and the few others who hadn't ever received training before that they would catch up soon, but lately, he hadn't been able to bring himself to even look up at the academy side. He'd sworn to become Hokage, but the way he was now, he thought he'd be lucky to even graduate. If only, Naruto thought, if only he had someone outside of the academy to teach him. Then maybe he wouldn't be so behind. He shook his head wildly. Jumping up to his feet, Naruto smacked his cheeks with his hands. If he had time to feel sorry for himself, he thought, he might as well spend it practicing. Drawing himself up to his full height, he turned to face the tree he had been leaning against. Emptying his mind, he felt his body relax. Adjusting his footing and planting them firmly into the ground, he curled his hands into fists the way he'd learned in class, and then he punched his right fist into the empty air. Then, drawing that one back, he punched with his left fist. Right, left, right, left. Over and over, Naruto punched repeatedly into the air, pushing his body to remember the motion, until suddenly, he realized with a jolt, that several hours had passed. The sun had set, and the temperature had dropped. He was rummaging through the bushes looking for his bag, when he heard the sound of footsteps and froze. Reacting on instinct, for the second time that day, Naruto ducked, trusting the shadows to complete his concealment. To his dismay, the footsteps stopped at a place not too far from where he was hiding. This looks like a great place to talk, doesn't it, Azumo? It was Uruka again, and compulsively, Naruto stepped back even further into the bush's shadow. Sure? It was an unfamiliar male voice this time. What did you want me for? I was just thinking. It's a pity the Konoha Archive Library is closed to civilians, isn't it? What? Of course it is. We wouldn't want sensitive village information falling into the hands of just anybody. But it's not just that, right? There's the Jutsu section, with scrolls on Taijutsu, Genjutsu, Ninjutsu. Well, yes. But civilians would just hurt themselves without formal instruction. But if that section was open to, say, academy students, that'd help them with their studies, don't you think? Are you feeling okay, Maruka? The voice sounded annoyed. Of course it's open to academy students. Not that my little sister seems to care. Oh yes, I forgot. They'll need an academy instructor's permission for more advanced level scrolls, but basic and fundamental scrolls are freely accessible to students. The Konoha Archive Library sure comes in handy. 
Don't you agree, Azumo? What in the? Wait, this is Katetsu, isn't it? Said the other voice suspiciously. Was that supposed to be your impression of Aruka? I'm right, aren't I? Uh, ahaha yeah, you, you caught me. Absolutely terrible, man, I'm a bit rusty, I suppose. Rusty? That doesn't even cover it. Aruka doesn't stomp around like that. He kinda walks with, with his hips moving like this. There was a rustling sound. Uh, like this? Yeah, exactly, spot on. See, you can do this. The voices faded away. After a few minutes, his heart still thudding in his chest, Naruto finally jumped out. It had been nerve-wracking hiding the whole time, but he couldn't believe his luck at coming across such a vital piece of information, the library. That was it. His mind racing with the possibilities, Naruto rushed home. If he had stopped even for a minute to retrace his footsteps, he may have found the conversation rather odd, as though performed for his benefit rather than a truly organic dialogue. Instead, he turned in for the night extra early, practically flying under his bed covers in his excitement. As tends to happen however, he found himself watching the glow of his alarm clock for half the night, willing time to speed up the whole while, and when he finally woke up the next morning, not having even realized when he had fallen asleep, he bustled around his apartment getting ready, with more energy than he'd had the entire past week combined. That day's academy lesson was thankfully conducted indoors, with a primary focus on reading, writing and math, and as soon as classes were over, Naruto was the first one out the door. He'd seen and passed by the entrance to the archive library before, of course, it was near his home, built right under the Hokage monument. But the sign had always looked so official, and the long doors too foreboding. Climbing up the stone stairway, he hesitated before the entrance. Reaching out with a hand, he pushed the doors, and despite their size, they opened silently. Inside, a bored-looking Chunin was sitting behind a black counter, and beyond that, Naruto felt his eyes widen as he saw a huge expanse of bookshelves, with tomes and scrolls crammed into every open space from top to bottom. There was even another stairway that led downstairs, to a whole other floor of bookshelves that stretched from wall to wall. Pass? The Chunin grunted, not looking up from the book in his hand. Naruto froze, his hands tightening over the strap of his bag, he looked down at his toes, wondering if he'd misheard Uruka, or Katetsu, he supposed. I, he started out. At the sound of his voice, the Chunin looked up, and as recognition flitted across his face, for a second, Naruto thought he was going to yell at him to get out. But to his surprise, the Chunin put down his book and scribbled something on a piece of paper, before ripping it out and giving it to him. Here's your academy student pass, he said. Naruto hesitantly reached for it, wondering wildly whether the Chunin would snatch it back at the last second with a sneer. But his fingers wrapped around the paper, and the Chunin let go. He returned to his book. Slowly, Naruto turned around, looking out once more at the bookshelves. First floor only, the Chunin added in his bored voice. Nodding, Naruto shot off before the Chunin could take back the pass. With his head wrapped in his scarf, He'd sneaked a few times into the public library before, but that had held nowhere near the amount of scrolls and books that he saw here. And it was far quieter here. There weren't any bored, mischievous children parked here by their parents, or feeble old women yelling at the librarian that their dog was missing. Naruto came to a stop before a bookshelf marked, Academy Level, and craning his head back to scan the labels on the scrolls, he let out a slow breath. He'd learned the characters for, Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, and, Genjutsu, just a few days ago, and they were all here. Spotting a stool nearby, he dragged it over and climbed on top. On the very first shelf, the very first scroll was, Taijutsu for beginners. Naruto reached out and pulling it out, was surprised to feel how heavy it was. Gingerly, he unfurled the thick paper, and let out another shaking breath at the sight of the detailed illustrations. His gaze raced from each stance to the next, taking note of each individual adjustment of the feet and hands. Naruto began to shake, and not trusting himself, he carefully rolled the scroll back up. His eyes felt hot, and he had to remind himself that Ninja didn't cry. But it took all the willpower he had to force back the tears, and only when his eyes were completely dry did he allow himself to open the scroll up again. He knew, now, these scrolls would be his teachers, his parents, his friends. One year later, the next bout will be between Naruto and Nogi. A girl wearing her hair back in a ponytail stepped out nervously onto the wooden platform. 
The platform, which had been smooth and unblemished at the beginning of the year, was now scarred with numerous marks of past fights, serving as a reminder of how far they had come since then. Opposite her, a young boy with red hair leapt lightly onto the platform, making only the slightest sound as he landed. He stood relaxed and comfortably, with his hands hanging in front of him. His name was Uzumaki Naruto. Nogi hated him. At first, it had been fun just because he was so easy to make fun of with his stupid hair, and she never got in trouble for picking on him, because nobody else liked him either. When her papa came home late smelling of beer and yelled at her mama and told Nogi to pick up her, damn, toys, there was nothing that made her feel better than running outside and taunting him with Funa and Yasu. Naruto never said anything back, but he never cried either, so it was easy to pretend that he wasn't, well, one of them. He was weak too. Nogi always relished her matchups against him in taijutsu, and always used extra force than necessary when pushing him down to the ground, even though she always got in trouble with Aruka. But gradually, at some point over the year, Nogi had suddenly found that he wasn't quite so easy to push down anymore. His awkward movements at the beginning of the year were gone, and one day, he even managed to connect a kick. It was stronger than she'd expected, and she was sent flying off the platform. Her friends were immediately at her side helping her up, but when she looked up, Naruto was already getting off the platform, without a second glance at her. Nogi hated him. It was now the end of the year taijutsu evaluation. She lowered into her preferred starting stance, a compact and defensive one that still gave her enough maneuverability to jab out and go on the offensive in an instant. She hadn't fought against Naruto since he'd kicked her, but she knew that she couldn't underestimate him anymore. The only one who seemed to be able to knock down the boy nowadays was Sasuke, and well, nobody beat Sasuke. Begin, Nogi tensed up, readying herself. But to her annoyance, Naruto didn't move. He just stood there, watching her with a blank look on his face, and after a few seconds, she couldn't hold it in anymore. His red hair taunted her, filling her with anger, and she charged at him. Her hands were outstretched, and she threw herself forward when he stepped aside. She felt something smash down on her back, and grunting in pain, she fell flat on her face. Before she could get back on her feet, she felt Naruto kick down on her side and shove her off the platform. She landed roughly with a loud thud, and coughed as a cloud of dirt erupted around her. The winner is Naruto. Nogi forced her sore body to turn around, and seeing Naruto's back as he walked off the platform, she felt hot tears begin to form in her eyes. She really hated him. After the year's evaluation, when Aruka took Naruto aside and asked whether he wanted to be transferred to an upper level class, he answered, yes, without a second's hesitation. Instead of being in the top of his class, as he was now, he would probably have to return to being in the bottom most rung again. But Naruto didn't mind, he knew that with patience and hard work, his teachers would guide him once more. I'm glad it worked out, was Aruka's last remark to Naruto, though he didn't quite understand what the chunin meant. That winter, Naruto spent even more time in the archives than before, determined to get an early start on his studies. And finally when springtime came and the academy opened again, he found himself standing before yet another class of strange faces that looked back at him with sullen eyes. Stealing himself with a blank look, he prepared himself for yet another year of insufferable snickering and taunting. However, to his surprise, his new classmates were slightly different. They were older than him, being 9 or 10 years old, and he found that to some extent, they had grown out of the ignorant cruelty of their childhood. They were at the age when they began to think for themselves instead of blindly following what their parents told them to. But at the same time, nobody approached him. Naruto wasn't an outsider, but he wasn't one of them. He was just something that sat beside them in their classroom and sparred with them outside. Well, that was fine with Naruto. He'd gotten along just fine without any friends in his first class, and the newfound peace in his current class was more than enough for him. He had his teachers in the archives. They taught him and kept him company. And even more than that, they were his friends, and Naruto didn't have to hide anything from them. Naruto had two secrets that he'd never told anyone else. The first was that he felt two types of chakra running through his body. Of course he couldn't see any of it, but if he had to describe them in terms of how they felt, he'd say the first one felt yellow, and that the second felt red. He had never tried directly using the second chakra, he found out early on that so long as he focused on his yellow chakra, he could easily direct it to gather wherever he wanted. 
The red chakra was much wilder and much more stubborn, and sometimes disrupted his chakra, making his ninjutsu fail. After some deliberation and several headaches, he had put aside his red chakra, focusing instead on controlling his yellow chakra. The second secret was that when he nudged his red chakra, a curious black seal appeared on his abdomen. It looked similar to the symbol on the shoulders of the ninja uniform, with squiggly lines coming out like the rays of a sun, but there wasn't much more Naruto could decipher about it. After all, in the academy, they hadn't learned anything beyond the bare bones of Fuenjutsu, let alone anything about putting seals on a person. The implications of there being a seal on his body were initially chilling. Why was it there? Who had put it there? And what was it sealing? Was it perhaps the source of his red chakra? To his disappointment, there was nothing useful on the subject of advanced Fuenjutsu in the archives, and when he tried to reason it out in his mind, all it did was give him a headache. Thinking about it rationally, Naruto would have expected himself to do everything that he could to figure out the seal. And yet, strangely enough, he felt no compulsion to do so. On the contrary, he found the topic of the seal even slipping from his mind, sometimes to the point that he had to stop and think about what he was looking for in the archives. It was a strange thing. But aside from the occasional headache, it didn't seem to affect him in any tangibly negative manner, nor was there anyone he could have asked about it in the first place. In the end, after several weeks of frustration, he put it aside for good and stopped thinking about it at all. And so, the months passed. Every morning, Naruto woke up early and, after his routine sets of push-ups and pull-ups, as recommended by a body training scroll, he practiced building up chakra by walking up the walls of his apartment. He also began to spend his mornings meditating and concentrating on feeling the flow of his chakra running through his body. It was hard to believe that there had once been a time when he didn't know what chakra was, it was the spirit of his very self circulating throughout his body. In the afternoons, Naruto attended the academy and learned about chakra and hand seals, mastering basic techniques. He studied how to set traps, how to disguise his own presence, and how to eliminate as much sound as possible from his movements. He learned how to detonate explosive tags remotely with chakra, and could release himself from all basic genjutsu. He was smaller than everyone else in his class so he didn't win quite as easily as he had before, but he made sure none of his losses were in vain. Instead, he learned how to weave in and out to confuse your opponent, and how to use his opponent's movements and body weight against them. And in the evenings, Naruto hurried to meet his teachers and friends in the archive library. In return for his loyalty, they granted to him their secrets, teaching him the lore of how jutsu worked, of how one used hand seals to manipulate how much chakra one used to fuel a technique. He learned that while the academy taught them the traditional way to use seals and jutsu, a true master of ninjutsu could perform a complex jutsu with just a single hand seal. Naruto had become such a frequent visitor at the archives, that eventually, the chunin had stopped paying such close attention to him. He didn't want to lose their trust, but sometimes when he thought it was safe, he slipped out of the academy section and went into the higher level jutsu shelves. It was there that he discovered that a technique called the cage bunshin, shadow clone technique, existed, which his usefulness far outstripped that of the simpler version they learned in the academy. Determined to master it, he slipped it back with him into the academy section. Then, he quickly read through the instructions, hiding it behind a scroll about the applications of water jutsu in agriculture. Reading through it, it became readily apparent as to the reason why they didn't teach it at the academy. Unlike the illusionary clones, the shadow clones took up substantially more chakra. It was an amount that the typical person couldn't afford to expend. However, in his experimentations with his different types of chakra, Naruto had come to realize that his chakra reserves far exceeded that of any ordinary ninja's levels. And so, with extensive practice in the forest, he was eventually able to successfully summon several shadow clones. Furthering his studies, he also began to read about chakra theory. He read about chakra affinity, and from a test with special chakra paper, learned that he had affinity for the wind element. From then on, following the rather cryptic diagrams provided in the scrolls, he began to experiment with molding his yellow chakra, observing how its properties changed depending on how he manipulated it. When Naruto first succeeded in changing the form of his chakra into being as sharp and thin as possible, and then released it, he found himself being blasted off of his feet as a strong gust of wind exploded in the area around him. 
Though it was exhausting, it was also exhilarating, and Naruto resolved to add elemental manipulation to his daily exercises, determined to master it. In this manner, three years slowly passed. When Naruto was ten, he graduated from the academy at the top of his class and was put into Team 7 with two other genins. A girl named Mayu Kamizuki and a boy named Rai Hagen. Mayu, a small forgettable girl with brown pigtails, was timid and seemed entirely too afraid of Naruto to talk in his presence. Instead, she hid behind their other teammate Rai, a tan dark-haired boy whose face was somewhat marred by a scar that ran strikingly across his left cheek. Neither seemed altogether pleased about being in the same group as the village pariah. Their Jonin teacher was the renowned shinobi, copy ninja Kakashi. Leaning against the railing of the roof garden, Kakashi looked down in silence at his new genin team. Their facial expressions and the way they had positioned themselves was very telling. The girl, Kamizuki Mayu, was biting her lower lip and looked like she wanted to be anywhere else but there. Kakashi wondered for a moment how she had passed the academy test. She had gotten one of the lowest scores in ninjutsu, and the de facto lowest in taijutsu. But the forgettable looking girl apparently had a bit of a flair for genjutsu, and had even managed to conceal her presence from the chunin instructor, which was impressive indeed. At the moment, however, she clung onto the arm of the boy sprawled on the ground next to her, Hagen Rai. When Kakashi let his gaze linger on the long scar across his face, the boy scowled fiercely. He glanced away. It seemed that Katetsu's younger brother would be a handful indeed. Finally, he let his thoughts rest on the third genin, Uzumaki Naruto. He was two years younger than the other two and yet, had passed with the highest total score on the exam. His new hite ate gleaming on his forehead, he sat noticeably apart from the other two. Though Naruto's blank face was rather more difficult to read, Kakashi could make out a note of determination ingrained in the boy's eyes. Oh ho! He had to wonder what exactly the boy wanted to prove so much. Despite his best efforts, seeing Naruto's face up close like this, Kakashi couldn't help but think of his own sensei. The boy may have had his mother's hair, but everything else was his father's. While he had been under strict orders from the third Hokage to not approach Naruto until now, he had seen from afar just how much the boy had suffered at the hands of the ignorant villagers. The third had said that the experience would make him strong just as how Minato had wanted. But Kakashi couldn't help but think that his old sensei would have been furious at him for letting his son grow up without knowing how much he had been loved. At long last, Kakashi clapped his hands together to get the attention of his newest team. I am your new Jonin instructor, Hitaki Kakashi. So that I can know you better, let's go around in a circle with your names. You can also tell me your likes, dislikes, hobbies, and your dreams. The three genins stared silently back at him, and Kakashi had to suppress a sigh. How about you go first? He gestured towards Rai, who scowled again but acquiesced. The name's Hagen Rai, the boy grumbled. I love anything to do with weapons. My goal is to become the best weapon specialist in Konoha. And, he glowered at Kakashi, I hate being ordered around. A handful, Kakashi thought to himself. Now the girl, he ordered. Mayu stiffened under his gaze and Kakashi noted with concealed interest how, for some reason, her eyes momentarily flickered in Naruto's direction. My name is Mayu. I like birds, and, and I dislike. Well, my hobby is looking at the sky, and, my dream is to work with orphans one day and better their lives. As she said this, Kakashi had followed her body language carefully. Nearly the whole time, she had been biting her nails while looking down at her sandals. But as she talked about her dream, she had stopped fidgeting, and her voice hadn't wavered once. Perhaps Azumo's younger sister had more substance to her than he'd initially given her credit for. Suddenly, a voice spoke up without Kakashi's prompting. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. I plan on becoming the next Hokage. Kakashi blinked. It was the first time he had really heard Naruto's voice. It was even toned and tempered, which was to be expected considering the isolated lifestyle he knew the boy to have led. But his words, their lack of empty bluster, and even more so, the conviction behind them. Now that, was a surprise. He hid a smile behind his mask. Maybe the third had been right after all. It looked like the fourth son had grown up to be quite interesting. The next day, the newly formed genin team waited at the training field for their new Jonin sensei. Though Kakashi had told them to arrive early, it seemed the man himself was going to be late. 
Grumbling about being hungry, Rai sprawled across the ground. Her face pinched with hunger. Mayu sat down next to him. As the minutes ticked by and the sun inched up the sky, Naruto observed his new teammates in silence. Rai Higain and Mayu Kamizuki. He had never really noticed either of them in his classes. Though that wasn't saying much, when he had barely interacted with any of his classmates over the past few years. The scant little he could recall of either of them was superficial at best. Rai was loud, and Mayu was quiet. It seemed the two had known each other for quite a while as well, considering how tightly Mayu stuck to Rei's side. None of this would have mattered to Naruto, except for the fact that they were now a team. He held back a sigh, he wished they would have just put him on a team by himself. It would have been less cumbersome that way. Though Naruto had made an effort to stay alert, when his stomach began to make rumbling sounds, he settled down on the ground. Closing his eyes and focusing on the stream of chakra running throughout his body, Naruto began to think upon their present situation. Why had the three of them been explicitly told to come this early for training? Why hadn't Kakashi come yet, leaving the three of them alone together? What kind of test could it be, that it would determine whether they were to continue training as genins, or return to the academy as failures? Surely nobody expected them to be able to defeat a janin? And most importantly, why had they been told to skip breakfast? Ironically, it was the sharp hunger racking his belly that brought clarity to his mind. Naruto's eyes snapped open. We need a plan, he said aloud. His teammates seemed surprised at his addressing them. What do you mean? said Rai, regarding him through narrowed eyes. Kakashi Sensei's test will probably involve us having to team up to beat him, he explained. That's why he's late, he knew we didn't discuss anything yesterday, so he's giving us time now to work out a plan. In fact, He's probably watching us from somewhere right now to see how we spend this time. His eyebrows raised, Rai looked around skeptically. I don't sense him anywhere. He's a janin, said Naruto. He turned to look at Mayu, noting how she flinched from under his gaze. You specialize in genjutsu, right? He turned toward Rai. You're a long-range weapons specialist. And of us here, I'm the best at taijutsu. If we team up and combine our abilities... I think we've got a decent chance at beating Kakashi Sensei. His teammates exchanged looks. Then, Rai looked back at Naruto and to his surprise, gave him a nod. Considering how the other boy had introduced himself, I hate being ordered around he'd expected him to put up more of a fight. Since it was your idea, said Rai, what do you want us to do? By the time Kakashi finally arrived, Naruto felt reasonably pleased with the plan they had worked out. Getting the other two to cooperate with him had also been much easier than he had expected. In fact, it made him wonder if he should have put more effort in reaching out to the others in his class. Your test is to take these two bells from me before noon, said Kakashi, looking about as disinterested as possible. Whichever one of you doesn't get the bell will be tied to the rock and forced to watch the others eat. Well, there it was. It certainly solved the mystery of why they'd been told to skip breakfast, but it now presented another problem. Had he been wrong about the reason why they'd been given so much time together? If one of the three was already automatically slated to fail, how could they possibly work together as a team? Just a single glance at how Rai and Mayu were eyeing Naruto told him that they would undoubtedly betray him if things came to a head. Fortunately, they had hatched some backup plans in the possible case of such an event. Just as Kakashi had started the clock, Naruto motioned to the other two, Plan B. When there wasn't an immediate response, he tensed. Would they move as they'd agreed upon? True, he made another backup plan of his own just in case his teammates betrayed him from the start, but its chances of success were significantly lower. But to his relief, just as he was about to consider a change in plans after all, they nodded in agreement and then disappeared in a blur of motion. Directing chakra towards his feet, Naruto silently leapt up a tree to gain some higher ground. Once secured on a branch, he checked for Kakashi's location. To his surprise, he appeared to still be standing where they'd left him. Either the man really underestimated them, or it was a clone. There had to be a reason behind this farce of a test. It seemed unlikely that Kakashi was simply a sadist and took pleasure in failing genins. The man had seemed a bit too bored for that. It was more likely that he was trying to teach them some sort of meaningful lesson. Yet the test was set up in a way that guaranteed that at least one of them would fail. Was this supposed to be a demonstration in self-sacrifice? Was one of them meant to patriotically sacrifice himself for the success of their mission? 
From the corner of his eye, he saw a flock of bluebirds come flapping out of a tree about a hundred yards away, it was the signal. Raising his arms back, Naruto flung several shuriken and kanai down at Kakashi's still figure. With grim eyes, he watched them strike their target, and with a burst of white smoke, Kakashi disappeared, revealing a tree log in his place. It was a clone, then, meaning the real Jonan had hidden himself and was probably watching, which could only mean bad news for Naruto, who'd just given away his own location. Dropping back down on the ground, he began to run. Before Naruto had gotten too far, he sensed the presence of an active pursuer who could only be Kakashi. Without making any visible signs of recognition, he began to slow down, as though growing weary. Then, without warning, he dropped to the ground and swung out several shuriken at the spot he sensed him to be in. A moment later, the presence flickered out. His pulse quickening as he saw something silver flicker right next to him, Naruto flipped out of the way. Just as he landed, there was a cloud of dust, and when it cleared, Kakashi was standing behind him. Not bad, said Kakashi. A beat passed where Naruto remained motionless, and he realized that something was wrong. Then with a burst of smoke, Naruto disappeared, and a log clattered on the ground. There was a hissing sound, and recognizing it in a heartbeat as the indicator of an exploding tag, Kakashi immediately leapt out of the way. As he spun into the air, a red-headed figure bulleted out of the nearby bushes and barreled into him. Raising his arm just in time to block the kick, Kakashi reached out with his free hand to close off the boy's movements. But even as his hand settled around Naruto's ankle, the boy twisted around in midair, swinging the length of his other leg at Kakashi's neck. Forced to let go in order to avoid having his windpipe crushed, he watched as Naruto landed nimbly on his hands before flipping back upright. Without a moment's pause, Naruto threw another exploding tag at him. As Kakashi leapt aside again, he saw that the genin had began to quickly make some seals. Before Kakashi could see what technique he was forming, the tag had combusted, momentarily distracting him. The next second, a sharp gust of wind burst into existence besides him, picking up a cloud of leaves and dust to create a miniature storm in the clearing. Interesting, so Naruto had wind affinity just like his father, but Kakashi had to smile at the naivety of the genin's plan. If Naruto's aim had been to blind him, unluckily for him, Kakashi didn't need to rely on his vision to be able to sense where he was. And as expected, he sensed the boy running directly towards him. Bending his legs, he prepared to leap over Naruto, when suddenly, he sensed upwards of twenty kanai shooting straight towards him from above and behind. Shit, thought Kakashi, as he was forced to roll to the side. In the excitement, he'd forgotten about the other two. On his feet once more, Kakashi dodged another leg sweep from Naruto, scanning the area for Rai as he did so. Judging from how the kanai had been thrown, Rai was probably hiding in one of the trees and had waited for the opening Naruto had created. And if Rai was around, Mayu was sure to be close by. Marveling at how far this year's batch of genins were pushing him, he focused and searched for her chakra. While Mayu may have been able to conceal herself from a Chunin, there was a world of difference between Jonin and Chunin. Just as it seemed that Naruto's taijutsu and Rei's onslaught of projectile weaponry had him cornered, Kakashi sensed a small disturbance in the ground below. His eyes narrowed. A second later, Mayu came bursting out of the earth and with a look of rare triumph, she swiped at the two bells that hung tantalizingly from his waistband. So they had still gone ahead with the plan. He had expected them to abandon all signs of teamwork once they were told only two of them could pass, but it seemed they had stuck to the plan. Naruto would first engage Kakashi, and Rai would provide further distraction. Mayu, as their most accomplished at hiding her presence, would creep up on him and take the two bells. It was a simple plan, but effective, and if he had been just an ordinary person, it would undoubtedly have worked on him. It was child's play for Kakashi to replace himself with Naruto instead at the last moment. If he had been any less pushed by the pursuit, he would have enjoyed the look of utter shock that flashed across Mayu's face as she instead crashed straight into Naruto. Two down, one to go. Kakashi began to look for Rai as he waited for Mayu and Naruto to disentangle themselves. When suddenly, Naruto disappeared in a puff of smoke. In the split second that it took for Kakashi to register what had happened, a flash of red came shooting out of the hole that Mayu had made. Watching in astonishment at the hand that reached out for the bells, 
He immediately leapt away, realizing his mistake. At some point, Naruto must have replaced himself with a shadow clone, a shadow clone. The real Naruto had hidden underground, hiding his presence behind Mayu's. A bell jangled. Kakashi felt a single drop of sweat roll down his neck, as he and Naruto stared impassively at each other. A single bell dangled from between the boy's fingers. Judging from the look of shock still on Mayu's face, she had not been privy to this part of Naruto's plans either. Kakashi had to wonder whether it had been a spur-of-the-moment thing, or whether he had thought of it all from the very beginning. Whichever the case however, it didn't make much of a difference. He had underestimated the genin, it was as simple as that. As similar as Naruto looked to the fourth, it had been all too easy to simply dismiss him as the cute baby-faced son of the legend. He certainly hadn't expected him to know a Jonin level technique such as the shadow clone technique, or thought it possible for a genin to have devised such a plan. But now, he knew better, and he would never so completely underestimate the son of Minato again. No, Kakashi corrected himself. He would definitely not be underestimating Uzumaki Naruto again. Very well, he said, shaking his head ruefully. The remaining bell jingled from his pocket. But since only Naruto got a bell, the two of you will have to be tied to the rock. For a few seconds, he let the two genin process the information, noting the look of disappointment on Mayu's face and the carefully blank one on Naruto's. Then he smiled behind his mask. Just kidding. Everyone passes. Letting out a big sigh, Mayu fell on her knees, and soon afterward, Rai dropped out of the trees to join them. With some amusement, Kakashi noted the wide, easy grin on his scarred face. It looked far more natural there than the scowl had. It seemed the boy didn't take too well to strangers, but was the type to quickly warm up to one. As his genin began to ravenously dig into their lunches, Kakashi looked over them. He had somewhat mixed feelings about how things had turned out. Originally, he had fully expected them to work separately, and completely fail at capturing a bell. Then he would have tested them, as he had with all previous genin teams, by checking to see whether they would choose to ignore his orders and take care of each other. This was the first time that he would pass a team for actually succeeding in their mission, and he didn't know whether to feel proud, or apprehensive. After instructing everyone on Team 7 now Team Kakashi, he supposed, to rest up in order to start missions the following day, Kakashi prepared to make his report to the Hokage. But before leaving the training area, he stopped by the memorial where his best friend's name was inscribed. He lowered his head, and thought of his own sensei and team. It all seemed like a millennia ago, and now, he was the only one left. He wondered if he would be able to pass on what he had learned from them to his own genin team. He sincerely prayed that it would not come for them at as high a cost as it had for himself. Knowing that the road to becoming Hokage would be a long one, Naruto had always had faith in his own patience. But as he chased down the Fire Lord's wife's pet kitten for the umpteenth time that afternoon, he found himself entertaining thoughts of premeditated murder. It's little wonder it's always running away, muttered Rai. With varying looks of pity on their faces, they watched the pig of a woman press the squirming kitten against her folds of chin fat in a show of fervent adoration. As the woman pulled out several crisp bills of Rio from her handbag, the kitten wriggled out of her grasp again and began to race for freedom towards the exit. Noting the look of extreme terror on its small face, it was only half-heartedly that Naruto grabbed the animal and returned it to its owner's claws. It had been several months since Team 7 had passed Kakashi's test, and in the days following, they had carried out a long, repetitive series of D-rank missions. Most of these missions involved mundane odd jobs that posed little to no risk to their lives, and they were getting restless. Nonetheless, Naruto was pleased with their Jonin sensei. The man understood the significance of chakra manipulation, and when Naruto demonstrated his own experimentation with his wind affinity, seemed willing to teach him how to refine his control. It turned out that most Jonin were able to use at least two elemental chakra, with Kakashi suggesting to Naruto that he could begin training in another nature once he had mastered his wind chakra. Despite his lax appearance, Kakashi was quick to correct any flaws or inefficiencies in their forms and never seemed to lack for experience or knowledge in anything. After the trial with the bells, Naruto had never again managed to get the upper hand against their sensei. Though it was frustrating at times seeing the huge difference in their skills, it was still gratifying to know that he was learning under one of the very best John and Konoha had to offer.
Everything about having a Jonan instructor was new for Naruto. But if he had to say, the strangest part about it all was that sometimes, it seemed to Naruto that Kakashi held no bias against him. Though the man's gaze was piercing and unapologetic, Naruto had never detected even the slightest glimmer of resentment or revulsion. He couldn't quite rule out the possibility that the Jonan's capability to control his emotions simply exceeded his own ability to detect them. But despite his apprehension, sometimes Naruto even thought that Kakashi seemed interested in teaching him. It was an odd feeling. Naruto tried to quash it, and yet, against his will, he found himself going out of his way to approach Kakashi. Gradually, as Team Kakashi grew more experienced, they began to be given C-rank missions. C-rank missions were missions anticipated to have some combat involved with the possibility of injury and the three genin eagerly snapped up every opportunity they got. To Naruto's perplexity, the three of them worked well together. Despite his initial apprehension regarding Rai in particular, after their success in Kakashi's belt test, Rai had proved to be responsive and willing to follow Naruto's directions. And while Mayu had yet to directly address Naruto, she silently followed Rai. In terms of their abilities, they were a well-balanced team. Mayu was their scout, being easily the best at stealth and having a certain affinity with birds that allowed her to transmit messages over distances. Her strength in genjutsu was also promising, and Naruto could think of a variety of uses for it, such as being able to detain the target before he or Kakashi arrived. Rai on the other hand specialized at handling long-range weapons, and was able to provide a steady stream of backup artillery on all their missions. Meanwhile, Naruto, who preferred close combat, was their main offensive power in taking down the target. He had begun receiving Kenjutsu instruction from Kakashi, and had taken to strapping a Tonto across his back. Their first two C-rank missions involved capturing dangerous wild animals that had been spotted around the lands of Konoha. Their third mission, however, was their first ever bodyguard duty. The mission's objective was to escort the caravan of a wealthy silk merchant and his family to the village of Yugakure in the land of hot water. Mayu and Rai flanked the caravan, with Naruto at its lead and Kakashi watching over from the back. Though the three genin were initially enthusiastic about their duties, the energy that had been bubbling within them at the start of their trip had all but dissipated by the fourth day. Having reached the last leg of their journey with little incident, the three were now dirty and tired. It was a matter of unfortunate timing that it was their sensei's turn to sleep when the rogue bandits attacked the caravan. It was the middle of the day, and everything seemed normal. Rai was laughing with the merchant's children, while Mayu watched them with a smile smile on her face. From his place at the front, Naruto was listlessly still scanning the distance in search of anything that looked out of place. He hadn't slept in over a day, and he was really looking forward to switching positions with Kakashi. When he noticed a slight disturbance in the distance, he paused and focused on it. However, after nothing had happened for several minutes, he dismissed the disturbance as a false alarm. He had only just returned his attention to the immediate vicinity, when suddenly, with an exploding sound, a wagon behind him burst into flames. Immediately leaping to his feet, Naruto converged on the burning wagon while Mayu and Rai rose up protectively around their patron's family. Kakashi joined him a second later looking completely alert, and together, they used water techniques to douse the flames. Even as the last flame sizzled out however, two more wagons had burst into flames. Sensing several shurikens spinning directly towards him, Kakashi flipped out of the way. As he did so, Naruto deflected several kanai away from the main wagon. He missed one that had been sent later than the rest, and the kanai embedded itself into the glass of the window, cracking it. From behind it, Naruto could see the shivering pale face of the merchant, a corpulent old man with thinning hair. Suddenly, there was a flash of black as a cloaked man leapt at the merchant, his eyes gleaming with the intent of murder. Before Naruto could react, the jonin besides him had disappeared. There was a cracking sound as Kakashi twisted the man's head in midair, instantaneously killing him, before jumping up to the top of the wagon where two more figures in black holding daggers waited for him. It had been so sudden that Naruto jerked back, it was the first time he'd ever seen somebody die. He followed with widened eyes as the body landed on the ground with a thump. It was still. Kakashi's voice shattered through his reverie. Naruto, the others are getting away. While he'd been distracted, two figures swathed in ragged cloaks had begun to head into the woods. 
Shane rushed warmly to his face and Naruto immediately leapt into the air. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, Shadow Clone Technique. Making two more shadow clones of himself, Naruto and his clones followed the remaining two bandits into the woods besides the road. They were evidently trained, and had some experience in dealing with other ninja. Naruto's first clone was taken out by the shorter man within seconds, though judging by the way the man reacted when the clone disappeared, he had never dealt with shadow clones before. However, they were no match for Naruto, and he had caught up to one of them within a minute. Ordering his remaining clone to follow the other bandit, he removed the Tonto from his back. The man's eyes widened as he flew towards him with the Tonto in hand, but before he could cry out in alarm, Naruto slid the blade across the front of his neck. A stream of red spurted out, spraying his face with warm blood. With a gurgle, the man fell to the ground. That made it the second time he'd seen someone die. However, while he'd been gawking the first time, there was a strange clarity in his head now that made it possible for Naruto to wipe the tanto on his pants before returning it to his back. Picking up the scroll that the man had been carrying, he looked around for the remaining bandit. Spotting the telltale rags getting rapidly farther away, Naruto jumped up the sides of a tree. Feeding extra chakra down to his feet, his leaps between each tree grew stronger and longer, and with his shadow clone slowing the bandit down, he soon closed the distance. Naruto could see the man from up close now, like the others, he was not wearing any identifying hit eight. The bandit's age was inscrutable, though the face was scruffy with stubble and worn down. The man could see the Naruto too now, his features twisted in visible shock. You're just a child, he said, just as Naruto's shadow clone reached him. The man pulled out a kanai from a pouch and waved it threateningly at him. The clone easily kicked it out of his hand, and as it spiraled into the air, the real Naruto grabbed it. Knocking the man off balance with a leg sweep, Naruto pushed the bigger man down onto his knees with his foot, and pressed the kanai against his common carotid. Why did you attack the caravan? he asked. When the man didn't respond, he added pressure to the blade. A thin line of vivid red appeared on the bandit's neck, and Naruto could hear the man's heart begin to beat faster. Let me go, pleaded the man, his voice raw with desperation. Tell me, I have a son waiting for me. He's six, we just needed money, please. Naruto paused. It didn't seem like the man was lying, but his mission came first. And the mission details did not include letting go a bandit who would undoubtedly attack other innocent merchants in the future. With a gurgle identical to the first man, the bandit before him fell to the ground. Red blood came bubbling out of the sides of his mouth as he attempted to say something. Hero. The bandit choked out, before his eyes glazed over. He twitched once and then he was still. Wiping the blood off the kanai and returning it to his holster, Naruto picked up the remaining scrolls and tucked them besides his tanto on his back. As he did so, there was a flicker of movement, and Kakashi appeared beside him with the body of the other bandit. Helping Naruto shoulder the second body, they returned to the caravan. All the fires had been put out, and the bodies of the two bandits that Kakashi had dealt with had been arranged neatly on the side of the road for their companions to later claim. The two bandits' bodies were laid to rest beside them. No one in the merchant's family had been more than superficially injured and with Naruto returning the scrolls that the two escapees had made off with, their finances were also more or less protected. Naruto mutely accepted the gushing praises of the fat man, all too aware of the still wet bloodstains on his face and clothes. While Rai gave him a nod of acknowledgement, Mayu shot him a look of fear before turning away to comfort some of the younger children. When Naruto was alone, he raised a hand and touched his face. Lowering it, he saw that his fingers were stained red. He'd taken the lives of two men in the same amount of time it'd have taken him to eat a meal. It had been so easy too, just a single slash across their necks, and they had ceased to matter. His thoughts turned to what the bandit had been trying to say in his final moments. Hiro, his son's name, perhaps? By the time Kakashi told Naruto that he could rest for the rest of the journey to Yugakir while the Jonin took over his position, he was so tired that he accepted without comment. Clambering into the wagon and lying down, he immediately felt sleep envelope his weary body. The road to becoming Hokage is going to be long indeed, Naruto thought to himself as he drifted off. In his dreams that night, the bandit's body was gone from the side of the road. 
The only sign that it had been there was the faint trail of dirt and broken grass blades that led into the forest. Yugakir was a peaceful and prosperous village in the land of hot water. The village was tucked away high up in the shrub-covered mountains, connected to the ground by carved pathways that spiraled down the side of the cliff rock. The country received its name from their famous hot springs, which were sourced by the many small rivers that furrowed through the land. These rivers all eventually cascaded down the side of the valley as thin waterfalls before joining a vast river. The village was apparently very popular as a tourist spot, and as Naruto and his team wearily walked past the entrance gates, they could see quite a number of families coming in with them. Within the village itself, there were a large variety of souvenir stalls selling festival masks, local specialties, and fans among other things. The center of attraction however seemed to be the big wooden archway with the words, hot springs, at the center of the village, which the majority of the people were headed towards. The sky was bleached with orange and purple as the sun set, and Kakashi decided that they would stay the night before leaving for Konoha at dawn. Hearing of their decision and overcome with gratitude for a job well done, the silk merchant gifted them with tickets for an overnight stay at a famous local inn with its very own hot spring. And so that evening, Mayu headed off by herself to the women's bath while Naruto and Rai hunkered down in the heated pool in the men's bath. Resting a soaked towel on his head, Naruto closed his eyes, letting his tired muscles soak in the hot water. With his eyes closed, he idly began to pick up the jumbled chatter of multiple surrounding conversations. The way they washed over him had a very relaxing effect. Oi, Naruto. Naruto opened a single eye to see Rai looking at him from the opposite end of the pool. Mirroring Naruto with a folded towel on his head, he had a mischievous look on his face. Much more than Mayu, and even more so since the incident with the bandits, Naruto had noticed that the other boy was talking to him with increasing frequency. It was a little bewildering and altogether new for Naruto. A small part of him skeptically wondered whether Rai was setting him up for something. However, since preserving the team harmony would be most beneficial to successfully completing their missions, he didn't rebuff the other genin. What is it? He said. Rai waggled his eyebrows. Think Kakashi Sensei will take off his mask in the bath? Naruto pondered this for a moment. It was true that he had also never seen their sensei's face in its entirety, though he had never before thought too deeply on it. I don't see why he wouldn't, he said. I don't think he has a medical condition that requires him to always have a face mask on. I bet he's hiding a weird mole. Rai smirked, or something else, he added with a more sober look, touching with his hand the knotted scar that ran across his cheek. Who's hiding a mole? said a voice. It belonged to Kakashi, who appeared to be stepping into the bath area. He was standing where the white steam from the baths was thickest, and they could only make out the outlines of his body. As the man stepped closer to where the two genin were resting, Rai stood up impatiently with a splash, straining to see his exposed face. Naruto remained seated, but strangely enough, he also began to find curiosity bubbling within him. Just as Kakashi was about to come into view, there was a soft hissing sound in the bath indicating new hot water was being pumped in. A sigh of appreciation rising up among the men, a cloud of white steam drifted up, concealing everything around them. Soon, Naruto couldn't even see Rai, who was right in front of him, though he could hear the other genin gnash his teeth in frustration. This is nice, isn't it? He heard Kakashi comment congenially. Hmm, this steam's making it hard to see anything. There was a splashing sound. Oh, there goes my towel. Guess I'll have to get a new one. There was another splashing sound, and then the sound of a wet foot slapping on rock as Kakashi climbed out of the bath. This is it, thought Naruto. Quickly making the appropriate hand seals, he then slashed his hand in Kakashi's direction. A gust of wind swept through the bath, rapidly clearing the steam clouds. There was a whistling sound, and then something that sounded like barrels crashing on rocks and breaking. This was soon followed by the sounds of high-pitched screaming from the women's side of the hot spring. Nice one, Naruto, cheered Rai. The steam had all but cleared from the bath now, and Naruto now saw that there were at least 20 other people standing around in towels. They were all looking around, blinking in confusion. Where's Kakashi Sensei? asked Naruto. Ah, thanks for that Naruto, he heard Kakashi say from behind him. I found my towel. Naruto and Rai whipped around, to see Kakashi back in the hot spring pool. He was still wearing his Hite 8 on his forehead, 
and had wrapped his newly rediscovered towel around the bottom half of his face. Covering his face with a hand, Rai let out a groan. After the three had finished soaking in the hot spring, they changed into cotton yukata provided by the inn, Kakashi somehow managing to put his face mask back on as well, before rejoining Mayu at the outdoor garden. Several families were by the pond, admiring the colorful fish that swam in its depths. It was dark, so the garden was lit with several paper lanterns that hung from lines strung all around the walls. Attracted to different aspects of the garden, the team soon split up. Kakashi settled down on the bamboo veranda with a book while Rai joined several other boys who were admiring some ornamental weaponry on display within glass cases. Mayu, seemingly entranced by the bobbing lights, excused herself to walk through the garden. In the end, finding himself alone, Naruto hovered by the veranda for a few minutes before slowly making his way over to the pond. The families had moved on, and there was now only one other man who was by himself at the pond's edge. Together, they stood in silence for several minutes, watching the fish dart through the shadowy water. Nice chakra control earlier, kid, the man said suddenly. Though you packed a lil, too much punch in it. Startled, Naruto gave him a cursory glance. The stranger had short, slicked back silver hair, but he was even younger than Kakashi. He was fit and his arms were muscled, indicating extensive training. The man, or was he a teenager, was not wearing a yukata like everyone else but rather simple nondescript black shirt and pants. Around his neck was a Hite 8 that Naruto didn't recognize, it had three diagonal lines. Naruto wondered whether the land of hot water also had a ninja village hidden away somewhere. What village are you from? he asked. Yugakir, replied the man with a careless shrug of his shoulders. Naruto's brow furrowed in thought. You mean this place used to be a hidden village? He couldn't imagine a sleepy tourist village such as this one being the headquarters of a group of highly skilled assassins. Yet the man standing before him was undoubtedly a shinobi, and from what he could sense, a very skilled one at that. It used to be a proper ninja village, before these fat merchants came in and turned this place into the laughingstock it is now, said the man, folding his arms across his chest. Now, the villages become just like this pond, and the people, simple ornamental fish. Naruto didn't respond, the man had yet to make any threatening moves, but there was something off about the man. It wasn't just the bitterness that laced the man's words. The combination of the cold, steely glint in his violet eyes and the just barely self-contained tremor in the man's muscles sent off every alarm in Naruto's mind. There was a splash as a pair of children in Yukata ran to the pond's edge. They examined the koi fish, pointing out and laughing at specific ones that caught their eye. Look at that fat one said the little girl, her fishtail braid dipping below the water's surface. She looked a year or two younger than Naruto, who observed them silently. Do you think Mama let me take it home, Taki? Her brother, standing beside her in a bright blue yukata, swiped at the fish in question several times before huffily giving up. It's just a stupid fish. It'll die in a day anyways, like all your other ones. Jumping out of the pond, he waddled away, calling out for him to wait. The girl shot a second glance backwards at the fish before struggling up and following. Naruto felt the sudden explosion of killing intent a moment before the foreign ninja disappeared. Dashing forward, he grabbed the sibling pair underneath each arm and jumped. Flying through the air with the two children struggling in his arms, the ground where they had been standing on just a moment earlier blasted apart into chunks of broken earth. When the dust had cleared, it revealed a giant steel katana in the hands of the silver-haired man. Looking up with a smile as he met Naruto's eyes, the man yanked the katana out of the ground. Jumping back with a vindictive giggle, he slashed at a passing woman and then disappeared again. The woman stared down in disbelief as bright red blood suddenly came spurting out of her thigh, and her leg collapsed in on itself. The explosion had stunned everyone into silence, but it was only after her single pained scream pierced through the garden that pandemonium set in. What's going on? shouted Rai, racing over. Naruto could barely hear him over the screaming, if they weren't careful, they could be trampled. There's a man on the loose, he said, just as Mayu, looking terrified, reached them, with Kakashi on her heels. He's strong, sensei. All right, team Kakashi, said the Janin, looking around grimly. I'll take care of him. You three focus on evacuating the citizens. They jumped into motion. Rai ran over to the locked entrance gateway, 
which a crowd of panicked people were now pummeling their fists against. Looking around frantically, he spotted the weapons on display that he had been looking at earlier. Immediately shattering the glass with his fist, he pulled out a scythe. Dragging it over to the gate, he smashed the doors open, and the terrified crowd began to pour out. Meanwhile, Mayu and Naruto had begun to help the various injured persons that were lying scattered across the ground. As Naruto helped up a middle-aged man bleeding from a deep slash across his stomach, the man let out a groan. Hidan, please, stop him. The man slumped against Naruto as he fell unconscious. Mayu rushed over, and together, they propped the man upright against the wall of one of the buildings. Straightening up, Naruto quickly looked for Kakashi with shrewd eyes. He had never seen the Jonin look so serious before, and even the horror of their situation couldn't distract him from the opportunity this presented. Now, Naruto would be able to see him truly in action. He quickly spotted Kakashi standing in a clearing, and shivered. Even dressed in a yukata as he was, Kakashi's coldly furious face would have set the most battle-hardened veterans running in the opposite direction. As it was, however, the silver-haired man, Hidan, only laughed maniacally as he began to swing the heavy katana around. Despite himself, Naruto couldn't help but feel impressed by the sheer raw strength and power the man was displaying. Don't just stare at me, said Hidan, tightening his grip on the handle of his blade. Show me what you've got. Without responding, Kakashi disappeared in a flicker of white, and faster than Naruto had ever seen him move, kicked Hidan directly in the chest. Caught off guard, Hidan flew backwards toward where the two genin were watching. Leaping out of the way, they watched the man collide into a tree instead, which collapsed from behind him upon impact. A deafening crackling sound reminiscent of a thousand birds filled the area, and a bright blue ball of spinning chakra quickly formed between Kakashi's hands. As Hidan angrily brushed aside fragments of wood from his chest, the janin shot towards them, leaving behind a small path of destruction. Just before Kakashi struck however, Hidan let out a mocking laugh as he reached out for something with his free hand. The boy, cried out Mayu, but Naruto had already begun to move. Pushing himself to run faster than he had ever done before, he leapt into the air. The struggling boy in the blue yukata stared with terrified eyes at the incoming Jonin as he hung from Hidan's hands like a meat shield. Grabbing the neck of the boy's yukata with his hands and tearing him away, Naruto spun through the air. The crackling ball of lightning chakra passed by mere inches from his face. He then snarled in frustration and leapt backwards, Kakashi followed. Landing on the ground, Naruto set the struggling boy on the ground. Mayu rushed to the boy's side to check for injuries, but he immediately pushed her away. He looked up at the two genin with only fear in his eyes. Get away from me, you monsters, he screamed, his small body shaking like a leaf in the wind. We're here to help you, said Mayu gently, holding her hands up to show she wasn't holding anything. No, you killed Nami, bellowed the boy, staggering backwards in his desire to get away. Naruto remembered the girl with the fishtail braid the boy had been playing with earlier. Don't kill me too, Naruto stopped in his tracks as he remembered the bandits he had killed the day before. His clothes back in the inn were being washed, but it would take several more washes before the bloodstains completely faded. He suddenly wondered if the man's son was waiting for his father to come back, shivering alone in the dark underneath a forgotten bush. Would he be as frightened as this shivering boy in a torn yukata before him? I won't allow you to die. Naruto held his hand out to the boy. Trust me. The boy stared back at Naruto with wide eyes, his mouth falling open a little. Aye, he stopped, and he must have found sincerity in Naruto's expression, because he stopped trembling. Behind them, Hidan screamed in pain and in fury, and the terrible shrieking sound of shattering metal followed. Naruto saw, as if in slow motion, a jagged shard of steel whistle through the air as it headed straight for the boy who now reached for his hand. Kakashi had just been nodding off to sleep when his mental warning bells suddenly went off. Immediately alert again, he hadn't had to look long to find the man behind the disturbance. He didn't know who this man was, but the Jonin knew that people like him with such little regard for others' lives, were one of the most dangerous opponents to have around. And the least forgivable. Don't just stare at me, said the strange shinobi, swinging his katana carelessly. Show me what you've got. Kakashi obliged, sending chakra into his feet, he propelled himself like a bullet towards the man. 
His opponent's violet eyes widened in surprise as his foot connected squarely with his chest. Letting out a grunt of pain, the man flew backwards and careened through a row of gangly trees. The Jonin raised his hit a 8, revealing the three tomo of the Sharingan in his left eye, and lowered his hand, Rakery, Lightning Cutter. As he channeled his lightning chakra towards his hand, the deafening sound of crackling chakra filled the garden, and a focused ball of swirling blue materialized. The silver-haired shinobi was still dazed from impact, and Kakashi saw with his Sharingan that he would not have enough time to move out of the way. The instant his rakery was ready, the Jonin lowered his head and shot towards the stirring man, tearing up the earth behind him with a sheer aftershock. However, just before he reached the man, there was a flicker of movement he hadn't anticipated. Kakashi, to his shock, sensed a much smaller and weaker chakra suddenly being thrust between him and his opponent. His hand was already moving towards the man's heart however, and he knew that he wouldn't be able to stop even if he had to go through the child. A surge of roiling yellow chakra, Naruto, was already moving towards them, and Kakashi, with all the strength of his will, managed to inch his crackling chakra slightly upwards. Naruto tore the boy out of the man's grasp, and to his relief, evaded his hand. However, the brief instant it had cost him gave the other man enough time to recover and leap backwards. Kakashi's hand instead slammed into the ground, the earth exploded, throwing up a huge wave of dirt. Nevertheless, taking advantage of the wave, the Jonin followed under its cover and aimed a quick kick at the man. Phew, that was close, said the man, blocking with his katana, and then swinging it at Kakashi. Slipping under the blade, Kakashi attempted to sweep the man off balance, but he nimbly leapt over the Jonin and slashed downwards. Though evading the sharp edge, the side of the katana crashed into the white-haired ninja. He skidded backwards, the heels of his feet creating furrows in the earth. The man raised his katana once more and flipped into the air, prepared to finish off the janin. However, having read his movements ahead of time with the sharingan, Kakashi rapidly channeled his chakra into his hand once more. As the man dropped down on him, unable to dodge, the janin plunged the shrieking lightning towards the silver-haired man. It could only be a testimony to the man's skill that he managed to get his katana up in midair, but it was no use. Kakashi's rakery pierced the blade, shattering it into dozens of deadly steel splinters that were sent flying through the air, and then kept going through the man's chest. The man let out a pained, guttural scream. Thick globs of red blood came gushing out of his chest. Throwing himself back, he landed heavily on his feet, panting. As he stood there, hunched over, he dropped the handle of the broken katana on the ground with a clatter. Looking around wildly for a moment, the man disappeared, and flecks of blood flew through the air in his wake. Kakashi blinked in surprise, he had missed his heart, but he had still severely injured him. The man shouldn't have been able to move, let alone move at such high speeds. Looking around for the man's violet chakra with his sharingan, he spotted it near the exit gate. With a sinking heart, he saw nearby another chakra that he knew well. Hell, this hurts. The man spat out thick blood, and grinned weakly. He squeezed the throat of an unconscious black-haired boy, Rai, and then nudged something on the ground with his foot. Nice weapon you got here. Real nice. Mind if I borrow it? Without waiting for a response, he kicked a red-bladed scythe into the air and grabbed it with his free hand. With a hateful look towards the Jonin, the man threw the Jenin into the air, and then swung down with his new weapon. The curved blades made a sick whistling sound as they pierced the air. Kakashi leapt into the air, and grabbed the limp body, spinning to avoid the blades. As he did so, he saw the man race out through the gate, leaving behind a ghostly, malicious laugh. Then he was gone. It was over. Kakashi lowered his hite eight back over his sharingan. Setting Rai down on the ground, he checked the genin's vitals and let out a sigh of relief. Looking around, he saw that most of the bodies lying on the ground had only superficial injuries, the biggest damage had been done to the garden itself. His eyes widened as he found his two other genin. Naruto, said Kakashi, running over. Mayu, what happened? Looking terrified, Mayu was trying to staunch a profusely bleeding wound on Naruto's bare chest. The boy was unconscious on the ground, the tips of his fingers still twitching. His yukata, which had been partially opened to reveal his chest, was torn and ragged. A long jagged shard of metal, covered in sticky blood, was on the ground besides them. 
Quickly putting the pieces together, Kakashi gently pushed the shocked girl aside. She obliged willingly, standing up. She put a comforting arm around a young, trembling boy that he didn't recognize. Gathering his chakra together, he prepared to use what little medical ninjutsu he knew to try and at least stabilize the boy, and then stopped. Impossible, thought Kakashi. Disbelievingly, he wiped away some of the blood that had pooled on the boy's chest, but saw that it was true. The deep wound was already healing. Even as he was watching, the skin was beginning to knit back together. Amazed, the Jonin blinked, as if doing so would somehow halt the healing. It didn't. He realized then that the sealed Kiyubi must have somehow accelerated Naruto's healing rate, perhaps by pumping out its chakra to save the boy. Sensei, said Mayu, her voice taut with fear. He'll be fine, it was just a shallow cut, he lied. Shallow? repeated the girl, her eyes widening. Kakashi wordlessly bent over, and picked Naruto's surprisingly light body up. There were shouts at the gate, and several medics came racing in. Catching one of the medic's attention, he directed them towards Rai, who was just beginning to feebly stir. When he turned back to wave for Mayu to follow him, he saw the look on her face and stopped. Mayu, Sensei, I already know, she said quietly. I know what he is. When Naruto came to, everything was hazy and out of focus, and there was a sharp, throbbing pain in the right side of his chest. He was alone in a dark room. Looking down, he saw bandages covering his chest. For a second, Naruto couldn't figure out what he was doing there, before the memory of what happened came rushing back. When the piece of the metal blade came spinning at the boy in the blue yukata, Naruto hadn't thought, he'd simply just moved. The only thought in his mind right then was how much he wanted, needed, to save the boy. He'd pushed the child aside, and that was the last thing he could remember before waking up in the room. Naruto wondered briefly if he had died and this was some awful version of the afterlife but quickly dismissed the thought. He didn't think his body would hurt this badly if he were dead. Just then, he heard footsteps outside the room, and then soft voices. Naruto tensed, wincing as he did so, before relaxing as he recognized their voices. It was Kakashi and Mayu. They were talking too quietly for him to hear, but it seemed like they were discussing something. A minute later, they must have come to a decision for he heard Kakashi's heavier footsteps begin to walk away. There was a pause, and then the door slid open, it was Mayu. Naruto quickly closed his eyes and feigned sleep. He didn't know what to make of his female teammate, though they'd been together for months now, she'd been avoiding him the whole time. In fact, ever since the mission with the bandits, she'd made an even more apparent effort to avoid talking to him. He didn't know what she was doing in his room, and he certainly didn't want to talk to her. He heard Mayu's footsteps pad over to where he was lying down. There was a soft thunk as she set down what sounded like a small table, his dinner, perhaps. Ah, oh, Naruto thought, so that's why she was here. But while he'd expected her to get up and leave right away, for some reason, she sat there in silence. Too wary to fall asleep, Naruto waited, forcing his breathing to stay steady. It was only after some time had passed that at long last, he heard the sound of rustling fabric. Suddenly, he felt a warm pair of hands wrap around his own. He tensed, and she squeezed. I'm sorry, I forgive you, Mayu whispered into the darkness. Then she got up and left the room, sliding the door closed behind her. As soon as her footsteps had faded away, Naruto opened his eyes. He stared at his hand for a long time. The next day, Naruto was feeling much better, and when the medic removed his bandages, saw that he was almost completely healed. When he saw how there was barely a scratch left on his chest, he inadvertently let out a sound of disbelief. Judging from how painful it had felt, he had thought the cut had been much deeper. He supposed that the shock and chaos of the moment had skewed his judgment, and Naruto felt a little silly for having delayed their return trip for so long over nothing. But just before they left the village the following day to begin going back to Konoha, the young boy he had saved came up to him. Thank you, said the boy, Taki, he had said was his name, looking up at Naruto. He had changed out of his blue yukata into black morning robes. His face was downcast and his eyes were red. He was probably still reeling from the shock of losing his sister, but he was much calmer now. Thank you, he repeated, and a single tear came leaking out of his eye. It slid down his round cheek. Naruto nodded, but he didn't respond. There was a strange feeling welling up in his chest that he held back, 
because he knew this was just another part of being a ninja. If he wanted to grow stronger, he would have to get used to it. But after a moment, he allowed himself to pat Taki on the head. It was something he had seen others do before, and he thought it might comfort the boy. For some reason however, Taki only began to cry harder. By the time they finally left through the gates of the village however, the tears had dried, and Taki waved goodbye to Naruto, sniffling. As they began to walk back to Konoha, Rai demanded to see Naruto's wound. When he lifted up his shirt to reveal his mostly healed chest, Rai let out a snort before slapping him hard on the back. And so, without major incident and only a few days behind schedule, Team 7 finally returned home. Despite everything that had happened to them, not much had changed in Konoha. The village people continued to go to the market in the mornings, and children still fought over who got to ride the swing in the playground. Naruto was still the village pariah. As he grew older, he finally realized that the reason people avoided him could not simply be because of his appearance as he'd once feared. But the fact of the matter was, if he entered a store without using a henge, he still got charged double the ordinary price. If he strolled normally through the streets of the marketplace, people began to group together in clumps as they noticed his red hair and whisker marks. And if children got too close to him, their parents would drag them away, scolding them. At one point, in a spark of inspiration, Naruto had wondered if perhaps his features really were a signature mark of an unpopular clan. But despite his best efforts, he found nothing about an Uzumaki clan in the archives, and so, could only conjecture as to why he'd been singled out from such a young age. Having gotten used to the isolation long ago, it did not bother him as much as it might once have. To him, it had simply become an unquestionable law of his world. And yet, despite everything that had stayed the same, he found that some things were not exactly the same. Kakashi had begun to regularly drop by his apartment, even on days when they didn't have a mission. Sometimes, they would pick up where they had left off in previous discussions of chakra application. Other times, the Jonin would take him to the training field and teach him some new kenjutsu or ninjutsu moves. After Naruto kept asking him about the lightning release technique he had used on Hidan, he even promised to start Naruto on learning a second nature affinity. It wasn't just his team leader. Occasionally, Rai would bang loudly on his door, demanding to spar with him. It seemed that Rai couldn't get over the fact that Hidan had knocked him unconscious so quickly, and was determined to get better. And in return for some taijutsu tips from Naruto, Rai would help Naruto with target practice, teaching him how to fasten letter bombs to kanai in discreet ways that the opponent wouldn't notice. Even Mayu sometimes joined in, though she never looked for Naruto by herself. She was always with either Rai or Kakashi, but she had begun to talk to him more and more with increasing bravado. Naruto wondered if it had something to do with the night back when he was healing, and she had whispered those words to him. Thinking back on what she had said, he had tried to figure out if he had ever wronged the girl, but couldn't think of anything. It was puzzling. He had a feeling that Mayu knew he had heard her words, and yet he couldn't bring himself to ask her. Still, nowadays as he trained with his team, Naruto felt light in a way that he'd never felt outside of the archives. Out in the training field, none of the other villagers were there. It was just them, the four members of Team Kakashi. After a long hard day, they sometimes all went to ramen Ichiraku for bowls of Konoha's finest ramen. The first time they went, Naruto had only stared in awe as Rai and Mayu squabbled over a piece of pork in one of their bowls. You said I could have it, said Mayu with an uncharacteristically ferocious glint in her eyes. That was before I realized it was the last one, said Rai, holding it out of the shorter girl's reach with his chopsticks held high over his head. Then, making sure she could see, he popped the strip of meat into his mouth. With a cry of fury, Mayu threw her chopsticks, like shuriken, at him. Skillfully, Rai batted aside the chopsticks with his own, but then froze, as the ricocheting sticks of wood knocked over Kakashi's bowl. They looked on in horror as it crashed into the ground, its noodle contents pouring out over the ground. Taking one look at the frozen smile on Kakashi's face, Rai jumped out of his seat and began to beg for forgiveness. Why does this always happen when you're around? The owner asked Naruto, the edges of his mouth twitching. And for the second time, Naruto found himself apologizing to him. And so, the months and seasons passed. Naruto's 11th birthday came and went with little fanfare, though to the entire team's shock, Mayu baked him a birthday cake. 
It was his first time eating cake, and while it was actually too sweet for his tastes, he found himself finishing his portion to the very last bite. Best of all, however, was Kakashi's gift of a new Tonto. Unlike the older one he'd been using, it was made of a special metal that would allow Naruto to channel his chakra into it. He made sure to polish it after every use. Team Kakashi continued to go on missions, though nothing quite as eventful as the one in Yugakir occurred. With Mayu's new willingness to work with Naruto, their teamwork grew leaps and bounds and their missions became even easier to complete. That wasn't to say that their team was perfect, though both Rai and Mayu were willing to go along with Naruto's direction. Rai sometimes lose focus, inadvertently deviating from the plan, and Mayu had a tendency to freeze up when anything unexpected happened. But while Naruto may have once considered them to be in his way, now, he found himself thinking during his free time of how to help them improve. It was some time into the new year, at the end of a particularly fruitful training session, when Kakashi told them that the Chunin exams would soon be taking place in Sanagakir, the hidden village in the Land of Wind. Hearing this, Naruto looked at his teammates, and they nodded back at him. He looked back at their sensei. Team Kakashi was going to be there, and if he had his way, they would all be passing. That's all for now. If you won't see next part, then please like this video and subscribe my channel. Thank you.